Hi, I'm Deja Tai. And I'm Anya Catherine. And Anya and I have a collaborative practice merging environments, performance, and creative technology, um, often resulting in immersive experiences um, of both physical and digital um, sort of modes. And hybrids. And hybrids, <laughs> yeah. So today we're going to talk about OnView. Uh, OnView is a uh, museum commissioned by the SCAD Museum of Arts, and it's an experiential work. Um, and we're gonna be talking about that today and also a little bit why we chose the topic. Yeah, so we were commissioned by SCAD and this was really the time where we started seeing um, museum attending and kind of art experiences seeming to start revolving around which art makes the best backdrop for a photo of yourself, of the viewer, and seeing, um, for example, Dijon and I went to see a documentary about Kusama and there was no one in the theater, but then at the same time in the same week, there's lines around the corner at the Broad in LA to be in her installation. And so we started thinking about the relationship between selfies and installation art, and then particularly noticing the ways that digital art and art and tech had started kind of dominating this sphere of selfie museums. Mm -hmm. And even people starting to feel like digital art was a giant projection selfie environment. Um, so we wanted to look at, unpack all of this basically. Yeah. And so uh, for us, we're kind of summing it up, saying the it's the generational desire to be the subject of an art experience. So like Anya said, um, kind of these digital art museums on every corner have kind of um, kind of groomed uh, a sort of clientele or a sort of audience to put themselves at, at the subject of that work. And we talk a lot about how that has transferred from experience marketing and selfie museums into the art sphere as well. And uh, that we like to say art sees a lot of backs these days. We can see the choreography of viewing art has come from direct perception of um, the object uh, of art um, from from your eyes directly looking at the art to kind of having this uh, camera screen in between or your art, they are back to the art or if someone taking a photo of you with the art in the backdrop or you kind of like scrolling and saying, okay, have you seen this art piece at, at Tate? And you're, and you're like, yeah, I have seen that, but you never physically were there. So this idea of our shifting, ever increasing, increasingly shifting relationship to how we consume uh, art. Um, so and, yeah. yeah, in this example we like to give, so the bottom is a piece, a performance installation that we made, the other one obviously the Mona Lisa. And what we like to look at is just how both of these experiences, obviously one is a brand activation, we made it for Adidas for a shoe launch and the other is a very famous artwork, both of them kind of become reduced in the end to Instagrammable moments. Like they become equalized in this weird way that you would look at and engage with a shoe launch activation, which of course was an artwork, but um, the same as something at the Louvre that's super interesting to us. Mm -hmm. And then the rise of the designer selfie where you pay to take a picture of yourself in a certain environment. So this really like extends beyond, um, beyond the art world and into kind of mass culture. Right. So something that we are examining, which is the generational desire to be the subject of an art experience, how that kind of shifted into um, more of the realm of surveillance capitalism and extractive technologies. And, and so when we look at those two things and we say, okay, how are those related? Um, this idea that the more engagement we have on social media platforms, which is a main uh, tool in which we uh, share artwork, uh, share our personal brands online, um, and then our continuing sort of engagement um, of using those tools um, by a photo capture, th those images are then distributed. Um, there is data procurement on, you know, facial recognition, um, location, um, many, all the, these different data points in which you're sharing that content. The expression on your face when you're in a certain environment, I mean, everything. Just right, and that's kind of building your data body and the, the more information um, that you kind of input into uh, this ubiquitous network um, of social media platforms, um, 
basically we have this scenario where um, there's better targeting, you have more dollars as this graph is sitting here and moving on to more tailored engagement, right? So it's this vicious cycle where we can kind of see um, the surveillance capitalism tying into mm -hmm. um, art engagement and how that plays out on social media platforms. Yeah, and an interesting thing to note here is actually at the very beginning, we were strictly interested in like, let's look at why people are engaging with art in this way. And we were not expecting to end up at this answer. We were not expecting to end up at surveillance capitalism and data bodies. Like we were kind of entering with a curiosity and then suddenly entering this whole other world and this dark underbelly that's kind of propelling um, these trends. Susan Sontag. Just any, <laughs> any chance to show or quote Susan Sontag. So, a, Right here, she's just talking about the relationship and the importance of images in a capitalist society. Um, screenshot this, read it later, it's great. And it's also so relevant now, which is wild because uh, it was written in 1977, but she really, um, talks about vast amounts of entertainment, including imagery that are needed to stimulate buying and anesthetize the injuries of class, race, and sex. So also looking at the relationship between this hyperconsumption and production of images and the relationship of that to capitalism and also uh, making us kind of care less about social injustice. Um, and that obviously we're seeing a lot. Right. So, and also the opportunity to become um, the object of spectacle, um, which is also the object for potential uh, surveillance and in the production of these images also furnishes a ruling ideology. Social change is replaced by change in images. Yeah. And we can't really talk about surveillance without talking about the hyper surveillance and hyper policing of black bodies as well. So I think this manifests in different ways and in more intense versions for different particular populations. So moving on, um, let's dive in to the work of On View and kind of give you sort of a thumbnail overview of uh, what this looked like and how it felt. Um, so the main question we ask in On View is, are you going to see what's on view or are you going to see yourself on view? Um, on view is a movement through three phases. We have the terms and conditions uh, here on the bottom right where it says entry. Then we have the stages gallery. And finally, we end up in the golden gallery. This is about a 20 by 80 foot print, just to give you an idea of scale. So the first space, the entry space, is the terms and condition. This is essentially an immersive contract where uh, you agree to, as the, the audience participant, and between us as uh, the artists. So you wanna talk about the contract yeah. a little bit? So this contract, this is kind of um, the place where every day many people check a little box that says, I agree to a privacy policy or a TNCs, and most of us don't read it and we don't actually think it's real. So Deja and I were interested in thinking about the scale behind that question of scale, that it's this little checkbox and it's, it feels a little bit harmless. So what we wanted to do with the terms and condition is blow up that tiny moment of clicking a checkbox into a room that you walk into and you enter and there's a contract on the wall. Um, and it's kind of like a Cheshire cat wrote a TNC and it's basically just telling the audience participant that we're going to take your likeness. Uh, we will recognize your face. You are the subject of the art, but we are making the art. So it's kind of cheeky. But also a lot of people looked in here uh, and they didn't want to come in because they were scared. And we thought that was interesting that people would never look at a tiny checkbox that says, I agree, it doesn't matter what they actually um, were agreeing to, but they wouldn't feel scared. But they were very intimidated when we blew this moment up into something where you were physically agreeing with your body in physical space. And the way that the interaction worked is that you would stand on the sensor in the center of the room, a capacitive pressure sensor. And as you stood there, a light would encircle your uh, circle your body. Uh, the privacy glass that you just saw there would go from opaque to transparent. And you have agreed to the contract at that time. And the sign says you are on view and you advance into uh, the next uh, part of the exhibition, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but I think this is a good time 
time to talk about terms and condition because actually our terms and conditions, which we call the entry area terms and condition without the Human condition. Yes, the human condition. <laughs> um, so it was interesting because about, I don't know, like a couple of days or weeks yeah. after uh, our exhibition on TV opened, uh, we got a call um, from someone at Surface who had attended uh, the show and they said, well, actually Hudson Yards just got busted um, the, for the vessel that is has the basically overreaching terms mm -hmm. uh, of use where just by the act of taking the photo, you're agreeing to a TNC uh, for them to, uh, for the company to use your image um, for Whatever. commercial use. Um, or promotional use and so they got busted for that and then the following uh, week uh, they had revised uh, their TNCs so it was just uh, interesting timing and uh, if you want to read more um, there is an article live on surface uh, on who takes a sardonic look at selfie culture if you want to check that out and the scary thing really about that is that the moment of agreement of agreement disappears and it actually collapses into the very act of taking a photo so as we saw we're in this cycle where our way of being in a space is to take a photo of ourselves and then uh agreeing and consenting becomes embedded in the act of taking the photo sure. and you skip the step altogether of formally agreeing which is scary <laughs> so the second phase of the exhibition is called the stages gallery and so this is a one directional uh, flow here so you can't go backwards. Uh, in the stages gallery it is very much a dark disorienting space. Um, there's quite a bit of reflection and also two-way mirror so you're never sure if you're seeing a reflection right here you can see uh, two people are they mirrored or are they actually there? A lot of these questions um, kind of arise as you're navigating through the space. Uh, we have atmos atmospheric performers connected to each other through um, the, these masks as well as show pieces and body pieces to the ceiling, to each other, to the walls. Um, and within the stages gallery, there are two photo stages, which are very much a theoretical parallel to the selfie stage, except there is one very important difference, which is you have to be in a body position designed by us in order to have your photo taken, um, So, which we call predictive choreography. So you can see here, there's some signage before you enter. You enter, you uh, jump into uh, this body position, and you activate the stage. So the two stages are called data body, the one on the left, and I didn't sign up for this, the one on the right. Um, so just to give you an idea of how one of the stages worked practically, what you would do is you would walk in, there's sensors on the floor, sensors uh, for your hands, and there's a look at sensor to confirm that your head position uh, is correct and how we have designed it. Once you have that choreography locked in, and only if you do, um, you begin to activate the stage. The kinetic blinds begin to move and pull up. It leaks the light into the stage, and you hear a countdown. Uh, this countdown is, you won't be able to hear it uh, during our live uh, broadcast, so I'm going to just mute us for a second and describe what this sounds like. So the score was created by Amon Tobin, and he also um, recorded a voiceover of this countdown, right? So the blinds begin uh, to move once you're locked into position, and you hear a countdown all the way from 15, and then once you get to zero, you hear uh, that your photo is taken. So what you can't hear um, as, as, as the audio is not playing, but I'll describe it anyhow, is that a mom's voice is sound like a woman's voice. Um, so you wanna talk a little bit about that and yeah. conceptually how that works. Yeah, so we, we did this on purpose, of course. We wanted it to sound uh, like a digital assistant or, you know, so we have this kind of sexy British woman's voice, even though Amon is a male and the reason why we did this and we didn't have a woman record it and instead we had him put his voice through a filter that kind of made him sound like a Siri or an Erica or whatever is um, we're 
we are interested in the way that women's names and voices and likenesses and qualities of kind of the ideal woman have been interjected into these machines that sit in our living rooms and listen to us all the time, but that it's usually men who are programming them. So the way that they kind of appropriate those qualities to make people feel more comfortable um, with them. And we think that if it was a machine named George that was sitting in your living room, listening to all your conversations and communicating them to Amazon, then you probably wouldn't trust it, but just, you know, giving it a nice, a nice name, um, Alexa makes you feel like, oh, that's probably okay. Alexa seems nice. Also, all the qualities, uh, the female qualities that are pulled into digital assistants feel yeah. very like 1950s idea yes. of a helpful, useful woman. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last phase of On View is the Golden Gallery. You want to go for this one? Yeah, so yeah. when you walk into the Golden Gallery, uh, you just left this very very dark, confusing space. You've got your photos taken. It's kind of dark and creepy. And then you walk in here. And in the same way that in the immersive contract at the beginning, you stand in the center. So you kind of know that that's the choreography of the space again. So when you stand in the center, then again, that circular light animation goes around your feet. And this time, when the circle completes, an image of you appears in a gold frame in front of you behind bulletproof glass. So in this moment and throughout the stages gallery, our, our idea behind the piece was everyone wants to be the subject of an artwork. And so we kind of were like, okay, we'll let you be the subject of our artwork, but we're gonna have to do it in a way that we are still the artist. So we're gonna have to control how you're standing. And if you wanna be the subject of an art photograph that's on view in a museum, that's fine, but we wanna still be in charge. So it's kind of like, that's where the TNC is. Little from. cheeky. Yeah. That's where the TNC is from. You yeah. can be the subject, but we're the artists. Mm -hmm. And so basically, and a lot of people after this as well were like, is there a QR code? Where do I get my photo? And we got to say, you don't get the photo. And basically, the images belong to us. No one could get them. And then a lot of people were disappointed, which makes them then reflect on, I'm so bummed because I was having fun in this because I thought I would get a photo takeaway and it kind of highlighted the way that people go and do things in order to get a photo takeaway. And if they weren't there actually present physically, they didn't get enough because they were actually counting on the photo takeaway to validate the experience or make the experience real. So even that moment of being annoyed and realizing why am I annoyed that I didn't get a photo of this um, was something that we liked to reflect and discuss with people after yeah and also one thing to note is in the stages gallery uh, while it, the lighting looked beautiful uh, to the naked eye while you're in in the space um, it was actually uh, terribly difficult uh, to take a photo in that space even for our own documentation mm -hmm. we had to uh, kind of adjust the lighting so we can shoot it properly but you know with your phone nothing really came out um, mm -hmm. very very well but if you were there it was beautiful yeah, it, to the naked eye. But if you're trying to take a photo of it, so the point being that um, there was kind of nothing to to capture unless you were um, sort of activating mm -hmm. the stage yourself. And even in that case, you had to stay in place um, yeah. as well. And a lot of people documented it like this. And one more note yeah. on the, the final uh, Golden Gallery was the gentleman that you see in the video standing on the sides, we were also interested in the presence of a body standing next to a piece of work and the way that that kind of validates and makes the work appear to be more expensive. So this is actually a SCAD student, a performer, and he and I together studied the body language of fine art museum security guards and had a kind of routine that he was doing. Um, so also kind of a, a commentary on the perceived value of art and just this tired person in a suit standing next to it making it feel so expensive mm -hmm. so also from a performance perspective um that was something fun yeah and he was kind of unassuming because he did look like an art security guard so i think a lot of people didn't even realize he was a performer nope so moving on so we anya just talked about um uh, the engagement here where uh, someone, uh, yes, we are at 19 minutes. Um, moving on, let's talk about how this uh, worked technically. So how did the gold frame uh, know it was you? And so we use facial recognition throughout um, various parts of the exhibition. Um, so 
already throughout the experience, we had built had been building a guest profile um, at the various stages. And then uh, finally, when you arrive uh, to the end, um, it recalls your image through um, building that guest profile throughout. Um, so it was interesting from a sort of art and tech point of view, where a lot of art that has tech in it can be sort of instantly recognizable of mm -hmm. art with tech. Um, this felt a little bit different in that while it had loads of technology, it was behind the walls. Um, even the sensors that you were touching, they were wood. Um, I think the most uh, techy thing was some of this architectural lighting uh, that you saw in some of the LEDs, mm -hmm. but still those are fairly low-fi. Um, so what we used um, throughout uh, is Touch Designer. We used it as a main brain connecting over 20 network devices, including facial recognition, um, kinetic winch control, DMX light control, capacitive touch sensors that we created custom, um, and, and so forth. So all of this was connected and to create this kind of virtual world, but there was no physical, there was no virtual layer between you and that sort of physical world and that virtual world. There was essentially you're just touching the physical components not really understanding how you are manipulating mm -hmm. things um, behind the walls um, and I think this for us is a shout out to ubiquitous computing uh, in which you know the environment in in which you're living and which you're working and um, you know existing in there is no sort of visible distinction between the technology and like the fabric of your environment surrounding you yeah, you're constantly being listened to and monitored and tracked and information and profiles are being built about you without your knowledge. So basically the whole piece is is essentially that. And that's kind mm -hmm. of to draw attention because a lot of people were freaked out, yet they do this on a regular basis all the time, just clicking the box yeah. and then letting themselves be listened to all the time without really realizing it. Sure. And just one more note on that, which is we are fans of ubiquitous computing, but it also is uh, fairly uh, problematic if it's not placed into uh, a, a system with ethics and uh, ways for, for law enforcement to feed into and sort of corral into a more ethical space. Um, so just wanted to call it out because we do think there is a place um, for ubiquitous computing to, to live and be of use. Uh, to uh, the general public and uh, also within the private um, sort of home as well. Um, but we're not seeing that so much at the moment. Uh, so moving on, uh, we just want to wrap this up by saying, um, so currently we are in London. Um, so we had to take a flight to get here uh, from LA. Um, and on this flight, uh, boarding, I saw this, and this was completely, I called you, and I was like, this is crazy. This kind of has this, like, on, so view on view kind of vibe where you have this, like, person who's, like, you're, you're this illustration demonstrating how you should interact with this. And, I, and you can see all these guys. It's like choreography. Up. Yeah, all these guys rocked up, which are, I guess, they're police officers with their guns and such like that. And they're setting up these, like, stations. It's like, what is that? And so their facial recognition systems to verify uh, that you are you. And, of course, these have always, uh, you know, been kind of mixed into the environment of the airport, but they're always have been more low key. And now it's just interesting to see them just blatantly mm -hmm. um, put out in in the public to say, yes, yeah. this is facial recognition. We are identifying you. And obviously you're in our system because there's this check mark here. So this was just interesting the other day yeah. um, to, to see this. Yeah, and, and to close and just tie this mm -hmm. to the larger subjects of our networks, um, Obviously, what we're seeing here, the prices that people are having to pay in terms of their data and their information and their privacy is completely absurd to just exist online, especially after COVID when we became less able to opt out of problematic digital services because they became yeah. our only way to connect to people and our vital communication was having to take place on problematic channels and devices and systems. Um, so we're excited to hear how any guests here who have joined us are are thinking about this and approaching this of how we can use art and technology 
um, in ways that we can draw attention to the problems of our systems and also more importantly to provide alternatives where we can engage and connect virtually and physically without having to give up so much and expose ourselves. Yeah, and that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both so much. Um, we're slightly over time, but um, I think we might squeeze in a question or two or wait while people type to... Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, we hear you. Oh, for a second. I, I, I can see a couple typings, so... <laughs> should, um, should we stop sharing our screen so we can see everyone? Um, the questions are coming from the chat. It's just us in this room, so... Yeah, okay. you can leave the screen up. Cool. And will you be reading the questions? Because we can't see the chat at the moment. Or should we go to a different view? Um, I'll read them. Uh, so yeah, there's a question. Uh, did the vessel ruling carry to other buildings? Do you Do you know? I'm not sure. I just know that they got a huge PR public outcry over that. And then they, of course, had to change it because everyone was talking about it. But I don't know that it led to a policy that made what they were doing illegal across the board or if it was just um, something they changed out of embarrassment. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Let's look into it. Fascinating. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you both for, for streaming in to our networks. Um, and uh, there's another oh, a slightly follow up from the vessel question. If I take a selfie in front of the Empire State Building, is it theirs to use? But I, I, I'm not sure if, if you would know if this appear, like, applies to all buildings or, or not. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I do not. No, uh, I think in terms of uh, the vessel, I think what we do know is that they did pr put out a TNC to the public um, who was passing by to take a photo. That in their action of taking a photo, they agreed to a TNC. So that was definitely specific uh, to that location. I'm not sure about any other locations, uh, however. Oh, okay, this makes sense. I think this probably answers the question uh, this person has. Um, so yeah, thank you both. Um, and uh, really appreciated seeing more about your work, um, replicating sort of a, a immersive installation um, that people can take selfies in, but then uh, taking away their sort of cookie at the end um, uh, was, was really intriguing. Um, so we'll wrap up, thank you. Um, and the live stream uh, we'll close very soon and we'll get our next talk started. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.